Mathematics is one of the most intimidating barriers for those looking to get into quantum coding. Mention linear algebra at a party next time you want to grind conversation to a halt. We talk to the author of an excellent new book that gives you precisely the math chops you need to code quantum applications effectively in this episode of the Post-Quantum World. I'm your host, Konstantinos Kragianis. I lead quantum computing services at Pertivity, where we're helping companies prepare for the benefits and threats of this exploding field. I hope you'll join each episode as we explore the technology and business impacts of this post-quantum era. Our guest today is the Senior Product Manager and Quantum at Scale Lead at Microsoft, uh, Leonard Woody. Welcome to the show. Thanks. I uh, actually go by my last name, Woody, so feel free to call me Woody. <laughs> okay, great. So um, I, you're here partly to, to discuss uh, this great new book you wrote. Um, but before we get to that, it's always interesting to see how our guests got to the world of quantum. And because yeah. of where you work, I kind of want to just dig in a little bit to what you do by day that qualifies you to write this book by night or whenever you wrote it on, <laughs> um, <laughs> on lunch breaks and day. quotes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Vacation every um, possible moment. So. Yeah. so yeah, what got you into quantum? Uh, well, I uh, did my undergraduate uh, at the University of Virginia 20 years ago in physics and computer science. Loved physics. Uh, really wanted to do a PhD in that. Um, but then I got engaged to my wife. And computers were you know, much more uh, commercially viable at that, at that point to say, and I needed to support a family. So went into computers. I've loved computers all my life. Um, and I wouldn't say I forgot about physics, but, you know, just went on the back burner. I did software development, uh, you know, C-sharp, Java, all that good stuff. And then when I joined Microsoft about four years ago, they had just released Q-sharp, uh, their, you know, our quantum programming language. And, you know, I asked my manager, I was onboarding and I didn't have any clients at the time. And I said, hey, you know, with this kind of free time I've got, can I study quantum computing? Can I look into Q-sharp? And, Totally expected him to say, no, we have no customers doing that. Why would you even look into that? But uh, he was nice enough to say, yeah, go for it. Why not? Um, so I started looking into it. And we have an internal conference here at Microsoft called Ready. And I really wanted to go. And, and my manager said, no, you know, we just don't have the budget, that kind of thing. And so I knew, like, the only way to go for me was to, to speak. And I had two options. I could do one on Team Foundation Server, which was my major technology, but I figured there'd be tons of applicants on that. And I said, or I could just do this totally out there session on quantum computing, because I figured there's not going to be much competition on that one. And I did, and then I got accepted. And then I was like, wow, I really got to know this stuff. I can't just get up there in front of uh, hundreds of people and talk about something that uh, I don't know well. So that really forced me to to start to look at it and study it and you know, the first thing that I came across when I got into quantum QD was the math. Like, it, there was so much linear algebra. I remember looking at the vectors, and I was like, yep, got that. Kind of remember that from linear algebra matrices. Yeah, you know, it's been a little while, but then you got into tensor products, and I was just like, yeah, that's, nah, I, I don't remember any of that. And, you know, it had been, you know, at least 20 years since I had taken linear algebra and the calculus and stuff like that. So, um. So, you know, I, I did my presentation. It went really well. And, of course, one of the best ways to learn something is to try to teach other people about it. And, um, it, yeah, I just kept on, you know, studying the math and, and going through that and just had an experience where, you know, eventually over time, I I went actually back to community college and retook some of my math classes. And oh, wow. Yeah. So, and it's funny, the second time around, you're you're not – you know, going for the grade, you're going for understanding. So it's been, it's been interesting doing that. And, you know, got the offer, uh, started blog posting about um, quantum computing. And then the publisher saw some of my blog posts and asked me to write the book, which, you know, was awesome. And, uh, and that's then generated um, a job here at Microsoft in quantum computing, which has really kind of been the pinnacle goal for me was to go from, because it felt like a career change, you know, going from kind of strictly software development, IT to quantum computing. And uh, I've been in my current job almost three months now and just really enjoyed working with, you know, the Azure quantum team and, uh, you know, learning about our products and, you know, all the different hardware devices from superconducting qubits to ion traps and, 
you know, we support Kiskit and Circ and Q Sharp. And so it's just been a great, great, you know, job at, uh, right now. And it's been a great, you know, journey. Um, and it's funny, I've always kind of waited for the passion to maybe, you know, turn off and say, you know, I'm, I'm not willing to do all this math homework and stuff like that, but it, it hasn't. So as long as the passion's still there for me, I'm going to keep on going. So. Yeah. And, and the book is called Essential Mathematics for Quantum Computing. And we're going to dive into that in a moment. Um, so I just wanted to hear a little more about what you do day to day at sure. Microsoft right now. Yeah. Um, and, and it's also just your background. Uh, it's the kind of thing that a lot of people are hearing about, like, you know, kind of physics and, and computer science mixed together. And it's sort of what we recommend until tracks are created for quantum yeah. developers. And yeah. uh, just the, how you made the switch. It's great. I think it's going to be inspirational to a lot of people. So uh, so what did all this hard work um, in shifting get you to now? Like, what do you do day to day? Yeah. So I work a lot with our, our Azure Quantum team on how are we going to message uh, our strategy going forward? How do we do thought leadership within the, the quantum world? Um, you know, I recently got to go to IEEE Quantum Week and, you know, a lot of it is also looking at the market. You know, what are what are our competitors doing? You know, how are they doing things better or worse? And, and how can we differentiate ourselves in the, the quantum computing market? Um, where is the market going? Um, and then, you know, also as our, you know, Quantum ultimately is an emerging technology, and the, the organization I'm in within Microsoft has a lot of the emerging technologies that are coming up. So 5G, Azure Space, those types of things. And so as these technologies mature, how do we create them into real businesses? How do we create the next $10 billion business for Microsoft? How does that happen? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a tricky thing to do, right? I mean, you've already got established things like Azure and, of course, Office and stuff like that. But, you know, we're taking this incubation quantum computing and we need to turn it into, you know, a commercialized business. And how are we going to do that with the field and, and things like that? So a lot of my work is, you know, trying to think how are we going to position um, Azure Quantum uh, going forward? So. Yeah, and we, we had on Microsoft recently to talk about the topological gap work that was done. Uh, so one day soon, you might be positioning a very impressive machine. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, we're always working on stuff and, and definitely keep your ears open. So, Yeah, that could be exciting. Um, so now you wanted to make um, quantum computing development easier for folks uh, when you wrote this book. And let's talk a little bit about um, the prerequisites for being a, a quantum coder. So Obviously, math is one of them. So what would you consider them to be? And you could include, you know, what aspects of math, too. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, there's basically three big languages out there, I think, for quantum computing at this point. If you want to be a quantum coder, there's uh, Qiskit, there's uh, Circ, and there's QSharp that, that we've developed. Um, and so, you know, I think most people that come into quantum computing are either coming from a software development background. So they've got the programming chops, uh, but possibly not the physics chop to kind of understand all the different, you know, physics concepts that need to be understood to do the, the quantum programming. Or they're coming from a physics background. And so they've got all that stuff and they just need to learn how to program. Personally, I think it's probably easier to come from the physics background uh, because I find <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to know in concepts, um, and physicists kind of dominate the the field at this point. Um, but you know, my track was coming from a software development, so you know, I know how to to write code. I've done that, you know, most of my career. Um, I actually got my master's in software engineering, and so really, what I needed to learn was the physics and you know, like I said, the first thing, and I've I've now read, you know, a number of books on quantum computing, the first thing that almost always they all start with is some sort of linear algebra. It just has to be taught. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was, you know, looking, when Pact came and asked me to write the book, you know, they said, well, we're thinking about, you know, the mathematics of quantum computing. And, and that really seemed like something I wanted to get into because I felt like, the books and the courses kind of gloss over linear algebra in the beginning uh, because there's so much, it's understandable. They have to teach a lot of stuff within say 300 pages or, you know, uh, let's say a five hour class. And you could spend that much time on, on just linear algebra, which I did in my book. So they're kind of like, these are vectors, these are matrices, this is matrix multiplication, this is a tensor product, and let's go, you know? And mm -hmm. if you've never come across those concepts before, and a lot of software developers haven't, it's like, whoa. 
and then you're just off to the races with superposition and and all the other you know concepts and and things we love in quantum computing and so you know you're you didn't get the fundamentals most likely good and then you're talking about these kind of far out concepts of entanglement and superposition and and things within physics using this math that you just learned about like an hour ago um and so that was really where I wanted my book to kind of concentrate on is there's good books out there. The one by there's lots of them, but one that uh, Jack Hadari did on quantum computing, he had a whole appendix on linear algebra and I really liked what he did, but I wanted to expand it and just have it. And I wanted to meet the software developer where they were at. Right. So uh, either they had taken the math a long time ago, like myself, or possibly they just had never taken it at university or something like that. And so, you know, I start basically at high school math and then go from there through everything you need to know to get started. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first thing I noticed when I got the book was like, well, I kind of thought it was be thicker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I saw the topics you were trying to tackle, I was like, geez, this is like 10 major areas that like, I, I can't believe he's going to accomplish this. And um, yeah, and, and it was clear and concise and no real extraneous uh, matter. I, I thought it was I, I thought it was really well done. Um, so when people read this and they don't have the background, one of the first things they might be surprised by is how early on in this learning process, all this directly relates to quantum computing. So you make a point in the book about how you shouldn't really read this and then go and do quantum, you should maybe be reading it while you're doing quantum and while you're actually yeah. experimenting. And and it's right there in the earliest. So like maybe, I mean, we're not going to dive into every little bit of math in a sure. podcast, but, but one great example is if you just want to kind of explain to listeners how vectors and matrices actually directly correlate in the real world to their quantum counterparts. Yeah, I tried to do that from the get-go, like you talked about, because I didn't want it to just be a dry, you know, straightforward math book. There's plenty of those out there <laughs> that you can purchase. Um, but I wanted readers to see how uh, the math correlates, you know, directly to quantum computing and the concepts. So uh, for the very first chapter, you know, where we talk about superposition with Euclidean vectors, um, you know, I just take simple vectors and they may not be simple to new people in quantum computing but you know it's just really two-dimensional things you probably have done in in high school and i define mathematically superposition by the end of the chapter you know and, and i think it's only about 20 pages um and i think that's great because any pop article you usually read on quantum computing says something about qubits and you know says well you know they can be in the zero state and the one state you know at the same time and they're a combination and it just goes on and on and so you're kind of, it's not the, the actual definition, you know, quantum mechanics and quantum computing is very math based. And I mean, one reason is, is that math is the language of physics, but I think even more so is that we don't totally understand what's going on at that level, at that nanometer scale. And so the only, we don't have the language in our vernacular today where we talk about, you know, apples falling and baseballs going 90 miles per hour and stuff like that to explain what's going on. The only thing we can really fall back on is our math. Um, and so knowing what superposition is from a mathematical perspective within 20 pages, I think is, is huge. Right. Um, yeah. and then, you know, the, the next chapter, just talking about matrices, Again, I don't want to be just dry about matrix multiplication. And, you know, there's plenty of stuff out there about matrix multiplication, but I want to connect it to quantum computing and how we do gates and how we do operators and, and stuff like that. Um, and you're right. I mean, within the book, most people don't come to quantum computing to learn math. Like, that's not what attracted me to quantum computing. No. Uh, <laughs> it was just, wow, it's this cool technology. It seems like it might be the next thing within in computing. And it also seems just, maybe from another planet, you know, it's just a totally different thing. And you don't want to lose that enthusiasm, right? Just slogging through math or just slogging through learning a particular language or stuff like that. You want to keep that coolness, if you will, that you saw in the beginning going. So like you said, do some math, get stuck, say, frankly, screw this. Uh, I'm going to go do some cool quantum computing stuff. I'm going to go program in Qiskit or whatever, or Q Sharp, run some of my code on the actual quantum computer on, on Azure Quantum or the other platforms that are out there and have some fun and then get stuck with that, you know, and they're like, oh, entanglement. And you're like, whoa, I know what superposition is, but entanglement, that's a whole other beast. Come back to the book, learn some more math. That's how I did it, right? I mean, 
Yeah. You, you don't want to just study math all day. So Because, yeah, linear algebra, I think of it as like the great uh, face dropper. Like when people come <laughs> to me in, in the company and they're like, hey, I want to join your team. What do I need to learn? Yeah. The minute the, the L and A come out, uh, linear algebra, like it's like... <laughs> you know, you just you just see that expression, just nosedive, and it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I also, when I talk to my friends, you know, they're like, you're writing a book? And I was like, yeah, and I'm like, it's essential math, and I don't even get past the rest of the title. And yeah, yeah, you see their eyes just go boom. I'm like, is like, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, took them out. so uh, yeah, kudos, because it, it didn't feel like just math. It was, it was, here's a vector, and in some ways, you're learning about a qubit. You know, here's a matrix, exactly. and you're learning about a gate. And then yeah. later on, um, some other concepts come up that people, like you mentioned before, like in articles, you always hear zero, one, zero, one. Yeah. Like, and, and no one really gets what that means. Um, I, I liked what you did with uh, the block sphere. And, and I mean, people see that, that diagram and they, they really don't understand um, how it works. And th then there's also all these concepts associated with like doing encodings. Um, mm. There's a lot of granularity to coding a quantum computer that, that people don't get. It's not just like drag the little cute composer things in kids kit and you're done. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's, there's a whole lot going on. Um, yeah. So if you want to talk a little bit, just I just wanted to be able to give a few what seem like abstract concepts, um, some description time here. Um, sure. You want to talk a little bit about the block sphere, just because I know people see it and they can visualize it as it comes up. Um, yeah, definitely. I. I struggled with the block sphere uh, when I studied. That was one of definitely my biggest struggles. I didn't understand it, but it seemed to be a central concept in quantum computing. And, you know, I remember, you know, I tried different courses and books to learn quantum computing. I was taking a Peter Soares class at, at MIT and, you know, he immediately brought up the block sphere. So I knew that it was important, but I couldn't wrap my head around it. And, to be frank, I kind of put it on a shelf. Like I was like, I'm going to sit here all day and for days on end and not understand this block sphere. I'm going to put it on a shelf and keep learning other things that make sense to me. Um, and lo and behold, you know, as I got more and more into the mathematics, it started to slowly make sense to me and understand why they, they did what they did with the block sphere. Um, and, you know, a lot of it revolves around complex numbers, which, you know, I had covered some in high school and, and university math, but it had been a long time. You know, I just, I think I, yeah, basically I knew about concept complex numbers of the square root of negative one was I. That's about it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I really needed to, and the other thing is that physicists kept talking about phases and I actually went on quantum computing stack exchange and I said, what exactly is a phase, right? Like I've never, you know, I've heard of phase, but it's never been used to computers. Like I just don't understand and the more I got into it, you know, understanding the, the physicist language since they dominate the quantum computing industry and, and marketplace helps you understand why they say things the way they say them. And, you know, I kind of in that chapter that involves the block sphere and complex numbers, I go through exactly what is a phase, right? It, it, and mathematically, it's an angle within uh, the, the number E uh, to a certain power. And what is a global phase and, and what is a relative phase? And, you know, what I really wanted to do was build from simply what I knew, which was the square root of negative one was I, to all the way to let's understand how the block sphere came to be and let's derive it mathematically. So by the end of the chapter, you understand why they're, they use this as a model. Um, and the reason ultimately that, it becomes important is because you have these rotation X angles or operators and rotation Y operators and rotation Z operators. And the reason they're named that way is because of the block sphere. Um, do you have to know the block sphere to, you know, go into quantum computing? Maybe not, but when you're talking to other people and they say rotation on the X angle, you got to get back to the block sphere. There's just no way around it uh, because that's what they're referring to. So, yeah, that was something I wanted to do was demystify the block sphere, the thing that had given me so much trouble over so, so much time yeah. in quantum computing. Um, and that's really why I read, you know, wrote the book is I had someone like myself in mind that had gone through, you know, these tribulations and trials and tribulations and retook a lot of my math courses. And, you know, when I took retook linear algebra, it was interesting that they didn't cover all the linear algebra that I needed in that, that semester course. 
And on the flip side, they covered a lot of stuff that I didn't need. Um, and I didn't want to force people to go back and not everybody wants to go back to university and take, you know, linear algebra. Like that's not a, a fun thing. So I wanted to take what I had learned and just take the parts that you need. You don't need a full semester course of linear algebra. If you want to, I don't want to hold you back, but you don't have to, there's only parts of those, those different courses that you need. So I tried to pick them out, put them in one book. Um, and the other thing that, you know, you referred to that it was a whole lot thinner than you, you thought it would be kind of by design, right? Because if I sent you a 500 page book, it might become a paper, you know, wait very quickly, mm -hmm. right? You're like, holy Oh, cow. it was a compliment. <laughs> I, wasn't saying, I wasn't saying that. No, like, no, no. Yeah, no, it was and, a compliment. And, like, and it's, I took it that way too. Yeah. Uh, because I remember I was at a uh, IBM quantum summer camp thing and the guy was going through different books and he came across one i think it might have been mike and ike or or whatever one of the you know books and it was you know 400 500 pages he's like you could try with this but you know i don't know and then he had this one that only had you know 100 or 200 pages he's like but this is much more manageable if i got a book like this i'm like i might be able to read that you know whole thing or type of thing so that was that was something i was going for too right um is you know you get it and you're like this i can do right um so, you know, I just wanted to meet people where they were at, especially, you know, software developers, but also other technically minded people that, you know, gifted, they, they're smart, they know technical subjects, they've conquered other technical subjects, maybe in engineering or um, uh, within software development, but they just haven't done the math they need for quantum computing. And, and that's usually the biggest stumbling hurdle for people getting into the field. Yeah, subjectively, it kind of reads as if you have like... Uh compassion for the reader at times it's, like, it's almost <laughs> like it's like this was tough for me so i hope you have a better experience with it <laughs> and that's why i wrote the book right like I, yeah. I i frankly wish the book had been there when i started to get into it because i i struggled you know i i read youtube or i'm sorry i watch youtube uh videos on things i read different articles and there's a plethora of books out there on quantum computing and i didn't know which ones were the best so i tried one and then i tried another and and, you know, lo and behold, there really just wasn't one that was just like, here's the math that you need. You know, there's a lot more in quantum computing beyond the math. But foundationally, if you don't have this stuff, you're not going to get a whole lot further in quantum computing. Um, so that's, that's you know, having a good foundation as you start your career, or your study into the field, I think is is very important, right? Because the rest of the subjects come much more easily once you have that great foundation. So. Yeah, and it becomes more and more practical along the way. And then when you get to Brockett notation, notation, I mean, it's like, it's right there. You're going to see that literally every single day on the job yep. if you're doing anything in quantum yeah. coding. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about how, um, a little bit about Brockett and how um, that translates in the Q Sharp world, just to give one, you know, one more concrete example. Yeah. So, you know, that was a, an intentional decision by me in the beginning. You know, I could have used, there's different notations for vectors. You know, mm -hmm. some of them just have a letter with an arrow on top. Um, and I said, you know, if we're writing about quantum computing, you have to use Brockett notation or, or direct notation as it's sometimes uh, called. And I might as well just enter, introduce it from the get go and just get the reader used to it. Because that was another thing. You know, I was used to vectors being written a different way. Uh, I was, I'd never seen this Brockett notation before. So even the the math that I already knew going in, I almost took a step back when I saw the Brockett notation because it didn't, it didn't make sense to me. Like I, I kind of knew what a dot product was, but I'd never seen it written the way that it was within Brockett. Um, and so that, that was kind of an essential thing. And, you know, I have a whole appendix on Brockett notation that kind of gets into it more. But, you know, I wanted to introduce it from the get-go. I wanted you to get used to it and and learn the mathematical concepts through Brockett notation. So that's the, there's not many, I don't know, really, of any linear algebra books that use Brockett notation to teach linear algebra. Most of the time, it's using the letters with the, the arrow on top and stuff like that. So that's the other thing is... You know, physicists, especially quantum physicists, have their own language, um, as, as we've been talking about with phases and uh, mm -hmm. interference and stuff like that. And and the other language they like to use is Brockett notation. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was something I came across was, you know, I read a lot of different books as, as I was writing mine. And the mathematicians are very rigorous. You know, they have to prove everything out to themselves and, and stuff like that. 
And the physicist is kind of like, the math is great, but we're going to fudge it a little bit. Like, if we can't prove it out, I don't care. If it works, it works type of thing. Um, and so that was interesting to me too, right? Like, you don't often think about it, but just the way that the, the physicists used the math and the way the mathematicians were very like, it has to be this way and it you know has to be rigorous um, and things like that. And I, like you said, I also tried to throw in humor. I don't know if it came through uh, every so often into the book because reading a dry math book can be, uh, can be hard sometimes. So, you know, I, I definitely, like you talked about, like told people to go take a break in the book, like, because yeah, <laughs> yeah. be quite truthful when I was writing it, I had to take a break, you know, I'm like, okay, <laughs> I got that half of the chapter done. I need to take a, a break for a few days before I get back to it. So, um, and as it regards Brock notation with Q sharp, um, you know, the notation itself is not really within Q sharp, but again, when you go to the documentation on Q sharp, we start with uh, Brockett notation. Um, and the katas and, Frank, and everything. Yeah, like and that. the katas, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. uh, which were done by my colleague Maria, which she did a really good job with that. Um, and so, you know, it's it's vital, and, and a lot of our documentation, I it, frankly, I, I know I'm probably a little biased, but, um, you know, our documentation on the math of quantum computing is where I started when I started to learn quantum computing. And it's it's very terse, I guess it's very compact, but it's all there within about eight web pages. So, um, you know, I found that helpful as well. And and sometimes when I was just doing Google searches on different types of notation, you know, our stuff was at the top in terms of, of how, you, how, yeah, how to understand that. So Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I, I really encourage people to read this book for sure, because uh, uh, I have a feeling that it's going to fill some gaps. <laughs> I'd be shocked if you didn't have some of these gaps if you're trying to make <laughs> your way into this space. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and we've done episodes before on just how hard it is to, to break into this field and, and the preparation. So I'm glad this this new tool is out there and I hope people pick it up. Yeah, I I, I, you know, I want to remember what it was like for me when I started my journey, you know, that I wanted to get into quantum computing. I think when I first started to get into it, you know, I've learned new programming languages, new technologies, you know, if, if I got to go learn Python, I could learn that pretty quickly. And quantum computing was nothing like any of the other technologies that I'd ever tried to get into. And even after three, frankly, after four years, I don't understand everything. And I tend to take it with a grain of salt if, if somebody says they do understand everything um, in quantum computing. And getting into the, the field, mo a lot of the people have PhDs. You know, it's just the way it is. It's something I come across in work all the time. Um, I'm surrounded by PhD physicists. Um, and so it's hard to get noticed. It's hard to apply for some of these different jobs if you don't have that that PhD in physics. But I also wasn't going to spend 10 years of my life getting a physics PhD. It just wasn't, you know, what I wanted to do at that point. I wanted to get into the field. So, you know, I think the, the best way to do it is, you know, I was lucky at Microsoft that, you know, we have a vibrant community within quantum computing. So, you know, I would find that community within your company or within your community uh, maybe start the community if it's not there already. Mm -hmm. Take leadership positions within that community. Get noticed by the quantum computing part of your organization. Um, go out and do presentations, podcasts, whatever you can. You can uh, because ultimately, when you come up and you don't have the PhD, you want to be able to refer to things that you've done uh, that are... I don't want to say equivalent because the PhDs wouldn't like that, but demonstrate that you understand things like that because it's it's very hard in an interview to, to test someone on physics concepts. I, I don't really know of a way of doing that. So, you know, getting a track record around physics and quantum computing um, as you apply for these different jobs, I think is, is important. Right. Um, and showing you can't fake enthusiasm and passion. Like you just can't fake that. So if you've got that for quantum computing, make sure it shows through in all the different work that you do and that you start to have a reputation within your company and possibly outside your company is, you know, man, that person is very passionate, enthusiastic about quantum computing. They're doing a podcast, you know, uh, hosting a hot podcast as you do, or, you know, their blog poster just out of this world. And I think the cool thing about people starting to get into quantum computing is that we still 
and I may be farther removed, but you still remember what it's like in those first three months, right? And you know some of the things that you didn't know then, and you can explain it better to the new person than someone that's been in it four or five, six years. And that's a vital thing. Like we need people to be able to explain those concepts that are very difficult to new people coming into the field. And I think that's where you can make a contribution. So don't just learn it, contribute to the community. There's, there's plenty of ways to do that. Uh, both with Microsoft and, and other companies and, you know, just follow your passion, I think is the best advice. Oh, that's great. I feel like we just got um, Appendix 6 to the book. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> or a second edition, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. very nice. Thank you for that extra uh, wisdom there. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I'll be linking to, uh, information about the book in the show notes. And uh, I really hope everyone picks it up because it's pretty great. I enjoyed it. <laughs> great. Um, I appreciate so. you having me on. Yeah, thanks so much for coming. Take care, Constantinos. Now it's time for Coherence, the Quantum Executive Summary, where I take a moment to highlight some of the business impacts we discussed today in case things got too nerdy at times. Let's recap. Leonard Woody found his way to quantum computing after years in classical software development. When he realized that he needed to brush up on specific math skills to make the shift to quantum at Microsoft, he not only went back to take courses for a refresher, but also decided to teach what he most needed to learn. He wrote Essential Mathematics for Quantum Computing. Like most great books, it's a work the author wished he had access to. The book is surprisingly thin for all the information it contains. As its title suggests, it's distilled to only include the math you need for the hands-on coding of quantum computers. What can often seem to be esoteric abstract concepts are taught in the context of quantum computing. For example, vectors introduce qubits and matrices introduce gates. It's an easy to follow approach and brings terms to life that readers might have only vaguely understood before. You should take a look at the link in the show notes for a taste of the book's contents and style. In a couple of days, you'll understand the block sphere like never before and will be comfortable with bra cat notation like a pro in the field. I'm already recommending it to those of Protivity interested in migrating to my team. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Leonard Woody for joining us to discuss his book on the essential math you need to understand quantum computing. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Protivity's The Post Quantum World and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Constant Hacker. That's Constant with a K, Hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in quantum computing services at Protivity. You can also DM me questions or suggestions for what you'd like to hear on the show. For more information on our quantum services, check out Protivity.com or follow Protivity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious. Mm -hmm.